see that there is an example that has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Good morning, Jenny's Suit Rental. Jenny speaking. How may I be of service? Hi there. My name is Max Jones. That's J O N E S. And I'm looking to rent a suit out for a special occasion. The customer's name is Max Jones. So you write J O N E S in the space provided. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to three. Good morning, Jenny's Suit Rental. Jenny speaking. How may I be of service? Hi there. My name is Max Jones. That's J O N E S. And I'm looking to rent a suit out for a special occasion. Certainly, Max. We charge a set fee for our services. You can either choose from our designer range and pay £50 to rent your suit out, or choose from our standard range at a cost of £25. So, what will it be? Oh, the first option, please, Jenny.、Uh, £25, did you say? Unfortunately, not. The designer range is twice that price. Oh, in that case, I'll take the second option.、Uh, standard, was that it? That's right. Now, before we go any further, may I ask how you intend to pay? Do you accept cheques? Yes, but only in exceptional circumstances. We prefer cash or credit card. Well, as I haven't got one, does this count as、uh, those circumstances? Yes, that'll be fine. Make it payable to Jenny's Suit Rental. Will do. Before listening to the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions four to ten. Now listen and answer questions four to ten. Now, Max, can I take your measurements, please, and a few details about what sort of suit you have in mind? Certainly. Let's start with the trousers, then, shall we? What is your waist size and leg length? I used to be thirty-two waist, you know, but these days it's more like thirty-six. Too many cream pies. I've been there. And about the leg, thirty-four. I wish. I'm afraid I'm somewhat lacking in the height department. Not even a thirty-two, thirty. I'm afraid. Never mind. As for the colour, could you do a dark grey suit? In fact, we have a very smart one of those in just your size. You're in luck. Now, what about shoes? Same colour? No, I think I prefer something darker. Okay, let's go with traditional black then, shall we? What about size?、Uh, I'm a size forty-five. Hmm. By my calculations, that's a、uh, ten in our sizes. And style? What have you got? We do suede, nubuck, and traditional leather. Definitely the last one. Very well. And will you be wanting a necktie? Do you do bow ties? Of course. I'll put one of those down on your order. Dark grey, I presume. Perfect. To match the suit. I think I fancy a light blue shirt. By the way. Might I recommend a green? Green would go very well with the suit you are renting. Light or dark? I'd say dark. Dark it is then. My next size is seventeen and a half.、Uh, hard to believe that a little over a year ago I could fit into a fifteen, isn't it? Those cream pies again, right? You got it. Now, what about your suit jacket? Same colour as the trousers, obviously, but what size? Medium should be fine. You sure? Yeah. And have you got any of those three-button ones? I'm afraid not. The one and two-button suit jackets are far more popular at the moment. In fact, the one button is all the rage. Let's have that one then. No problem. Now. That's the end of section one. You have half a minute to check your answers.
Test 1. Listening. Section 2. You will hear an extract from a radio program for people who live abroad. Listen and answer questions 11 to 17. You're listening to Expat News, a weekly broadcast for the English-speaking community in this great city. In today's programme, we'll be hearing from Tom O'Hara, who's going to tell us about all those different associations he can join. Tom. Good evening. Yes, in a city with so many of its residents born outside the country, it's hardly surprising there's such a huge range of expatriate clubs and societies. And many of these, of course, are aimed at English speakers. So, first, and perhaps most obviously, we have the sports clubs, which in some cases field teams in things like rugby and tennis that compete against clubs in other parts of the country, or even abroad. You don't have to play at this level to have fun, though. They can be just a great way to do some exercise, and, of course, to get to know other people, especially if you're new in town. The same can be said of the many hobby and interest clubs that have sprung up here. Everything from landscape photography, such as the Viewfinders Club in the Harbour District, or focus on the airport road, to old favourites like stamp collecting. Remember that this country has a long tradition of unusual and perhaps even eccentric societies, so there should be something for everyone. A place where you can meet people of different nationalities with the same social and or cultural interests as you. For those who may be interested in rather more than just friendship, there's a wide range of lively social clubs. Several singles associations organise dancing of various kinds, while for people in a real hurry, there's speed dating, in which everyone talks to everyone else for just five minutes. Then at the end, they decide which of them they would like to meet again by ticking their names on a list. In complete contrast to these are the many religious associations, reflecting the diversity of faith groups present in this multicultural city. Many of them, of course, have their own places of worship. Perhaps also of interest to those who've come here from other parts of the world are the international and cultural societies. These often provide a meeting place for people from a specific country, China, for instance, and particular ethnic groups, such as Afro-Caribbeans. As in other major cities, we have here local branches of many charities with names familiar around the world. Meetings of human rights organisations like Amnesty International are held regularly in English, as are those of environmental groups such as Greenpeace. All funds raised, by the way, go to the same kinds of good cause as they do in other countries you may have lived in. Inevitably, perhaps, there are also the political clubs, often connected with a particular party and, indeed, a particular country. So we have, for example, a local association of Republicans linked to and campaigning for that party in the US, and Liberal Democrats here doing the same for their party in Britain. Finally, on a lighter note, there's plenty to choose from in the performing arts. Whether you enjoy taking part or just watching and listening, you can take your pick from a whole range of groups. To take just a couple of examples, there's Light Opera at the Memorial Hall in the city centre, or a very lively amateur theatre company in the Park District. In summer, they give open-air performances of Shakespeare plays, free of charge. Test 1. Listening. Section 2. Now answer questions 18 to 20. I should mention at this point that clearly some districts have a higher concentration of English-speaking clubs than others, and that certain parts of town tend to specialise in particular activities. An obvious example would be the number of water sports clubs down near the river. Whatever the number, though, they usually have one thing in common. With the exception of a few associations linked to particular countries and supported by their embassies here, 
In the vast majority of cases, it is the individual members who fund them, so an entry fee or a subscription will be charged. You may be used to council subsidised sports centres and the like in your home country, but I'm afraid that's not the case here. Assuming you can afford it then, you can be fairly sure that somewhere out there you'll find a club that caters for your own particular fascination. If it's very important to you and you intend to spend a lot of time on it, it might even determine which district of the city you decide to live in. In the unlikely event that you really can't find such a club, the solution is to try to persuade friends and anyone else you meet of the need for one. You could also use the local small ads on the internet to suggest the idea. You'll be amazed at just how many people share even the strangest interest. Then you can start your own. That is the end of section two. Now turn to section three. Section three. You will hear a conversation between two senior students who have to organize a competition for the University Open Day. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 27. Listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 27. Hi, Grant. What sort of competition do you think we should organize? Well, Claire, the Open Day Committee was pretty clear on that. It must be something with youth appeal. That makes sense. After all, most of the visitors will have just left high school. Yeah, so I was thinking technology. Do you mean something which uses the latest technology, like an iPod? Something like that, but a bit more expensive, maybe. What about the latest iPhone? I'm saving up for one right now. Let's make it an iPad. I wish I'd had a tablet computer when I started university. Yeah, that's a great idea. That should get a lot of our younger visitors interested. Right. Let's go with that, then. Fine. We could go into town now and buy it. I saw great deals advertised at the Rick Smith store. Oh, I don't think we'll have to worry about that. A university purchase order will probably be arranged through the resources and supplies section. Well, that's settled, then. What about the competition? Is it going to be a game of skill or a guessing game? Or something else. What do you think would work best? Good question. I don't think it should be anything too hard, or anything that will make the visitors look silly. Some of them have such fragile egos. True. So, something that anyone can do. Nothing competitive, no skill or intelligence involved. That's right. But the main thing is that the contestants have a lot of fun. How do we do that? Well, I was thinking of a popular TV series, science fiction or science fantasy. I don't actually know the difference. Go on. It's a series where in every episode, the main characters step through a portal into another world or another era. What's a portal? It's like a gateway or entrance to something. Okay, I get it. They'll be stepping into the new world of tertiary learning. So somehow we encourage people to step through this portal. Then what? They get their photo taken. Is that all? Not exactly. Let me think. I can't see how that's a competition, unless we pick the best photograph. But there's not much excitement or involvement in that for the participants. Hmm, wait. We don't decide on the winner. I mean, no one person does. We get them, 
the public to do it. How? Put all the photos on Facebook, and the one with the most votes wins. I agree. Good idea. But there's just one more thing I'm not clear about. How do we get hold of a portal? I was thinking graduates of the engineering department could construct it as part of their contribution to Open Day. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions twenty-eight to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-eight to thirty. How do visitors enter the competition on Open Day? Well, firstly, they have to make their way to the portal photo booth on campus. Okay, a bit like a treasure hunt to start with. Yes, and then they get their photo taken stepping through the portal. And they'll have to write down their details. You know, name. Phone number, email. No, hang on. Let's keep it simple. Just name and email address should do. Then, after say the thirtieth of July, people can visit the university Facebook page and vote for their favorite photo. So the photo with the most votes wins. Yes, I think that should generate quite a bit of interest. What about a cutoff date? Of course, maybe um. The most popular photo as of 5 p.m. on the 10th of August will collect the iPad, and the winner will be notified by email. And the winning photo will be enlarged and published in full color on the university Facebook page. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section four on page one hundred and sixteen. Section four. You will hear a lecturer talking about the solar eclipse in history. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to thirty-six. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to thirty-six. Good evening and welcome to this month's Observatory Club lecture. I'm Donald Mackey and I'm here to talk to you about the solar eclipse in history. A thousand years ago, a total eclipse of the sun was a terrifying religious experience, but these days, an eclipse is more likely to be viewed as a tourist attraction than as a scientific or spiritual event. People will travel literally miles to be in the right place at the right time to get the best view of their eclipse. Well, what exactly causes a solar eclipse when the world goes dark for a few minutes in the middle of the day? Scientifically speaking, the dark spot itself is easy to explain. It's the shadow of the moon streaking across the Earth. This happens every year or two, each time along a different and, to all intents and purposes, a seemingly random piece of the globe. In the past, 
People often interpreted an eclipse as a danger signal heralding disaster, and in fact the Chinese were so disturbed by these events that they included among their gods one whose job it was to prevent eclipses. But whether or not you're superstitious or take a purely scientific view, our earthly eclipses are special in three ways. Firstly, there can be no doubt that they're very beautiful. It's as if a deep blue curtain had fallen over the daytime sky as the sun becomes a black void surrounded by the glow of its outer atmosphere. But beyond this, total eclipses possess a second more compelling beauty in the eyes of us scientists, for they offer a unique opportunity for research. Only during an eclipse can we study the corona and other dim things that are normally lost in the sun's glare. And thirdly, they are rare. Even though an eclipse of the sun occurs somewhere on Earth every year or two, if you sit in your garden and wait, it will take 375 years on average for one to come to you. If the moon were any larger, eclipses would become a monthly bore. If it were smaller, they simply would not be possible. The ancient Babylonian priests, who spent a fair bit of time staring at the sky, had already noted that there was an 18-year pattern in their occurrence, but they didn't have the mathematics to predict an eclipse accurately. In the second part, the speaker talks about a number of scientists. Look at questions 37 to 40. Now listen carefully and complete the table. It was Edmund Halley, the English astronomer, who knew his maths well enough to predict the return of the comet, which incidentally bears his name, and in 1715 he became the first person to make an accurate eclipse prediction. This brought eclipses firmly into the scientific domain, and they've since allowed a number of important scientific discoveries to be made. For instance, in the eclipse of 1868, two scientists, Janssen and Lockyer, were observing the sun's atmosphere, and it was these observations that ultimately led to the discovery of a new element. They named the element helium, after the Greek god of the sun. This was a major find, because helium turned out to be the most common element in the universe after hydrogen. Another great triumph involved Mercury. I'll just put that up on the board for you now. See, there's Mercury, the planet closest to the Sun, then Venus, Earth, etc. For centuries, scientists had been unable to understand why Mercury appeared to rotate faster than it should. Some astronomers suggested that there might be an undiscovered planet causing this unusual orbit, and even gave it the name Vulcan. During the eclipse of 1878, an American astronomer, James Watson, thought he'd spotted this so-called lost planet. But, alas for him, he was later obliged to admit that he'd been wrong about Vulcan and withdrew his claim. Then Albert Einstein came on the scene. Einstein suggested that, rather than being wrong about the number of planets, astronomers were actually wrong about gravity. Einstein's theory of relativity, for which he is so famous, disagreed with Newton's law of gravity in just the right way to explain Mercury's odd orbit. He also realised that a definitive test would be possible during the total eclipse of 1919, and this is indeed when his theory was finally proved correct. So, there you have several examples of how eclipses have helped to increase our understanding of the universe. And now let's move on to the social aspects, and I think you'll find... That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.